All right, well, we're gonna get going and continue on a few weeks, well, I guess maybe almost a month ago. Um, we started this uh, series of Lent, just a season of Lent, traditionally. Um, it's, a, it's a Christian tradition of 40 days leading up to the date of Easter, the Sunday where our Lord and Savior rose to give us life. So we celebrate that time and take a, a bit of a time of reflection on our own lives. How many of you guys realize it's good to self-reflect? We're going to be talking about that a bit today. How many of you guys have ever met somebody who uh, who just had zero self-awareness of uh, the things that annoyed other people? They just lived in their own world like nobody was around them. Are you identifying that way, Randy? Or are you just saying you know someone like that? I had a partner like that for 20 years. <laughs> had a partner like that, yeah. There are just some people who uh, who just don't reflect well upon themselves. There's no self-awareness there. And, and this season of Lent is a good time for us to just uh, take account of your life. Um, I think it's good to do this periodically, uh, financially and, and relationally. Uh, who's in your life? Uh, who, who are you becoming like? Who is becoming like you? Who's following you? Uh, is anybody following you? Uh, take a time of reflection. There's a good time for lament and uh, being sorrowful for the the ways that we just have failed God and have failed people around us. That's a, a good thing to understand that we're not the most amazing people in the world, that we are also fallen beings and the Holy Spirit of God is still is desiring to work on us and work in our lives. And then just fasting, um, creating this desire and focusing that desire for food on spiritual food, on a connection with God, uh, very important thing. So this time leading up to Easter is traditionally used in that way to be able to fast. And I know certain people fast certain things that they realize may have a grip on their life after a bit of self-reflection. You might realize hey, um, you know, I've been spending a lot of time on uh, watching TV or consuming things, or uh, I've been eating a lot, or I've been on my cell phone too much, or um, I haven't been caring for the people around me very much. So you kind of um, use this season, this time of Lent to self-reflect and make changes, significant changes. I think a lot of people do this around the first of the year too. Uh, it, although for most people that I know, it doesn't last very long. The New Year's resolution, they usually last until, um, you know, the second or the seventh, maybe the first week of going to the gym or whatever people tend to do. So I think it is a good uh, and healthy season to just uh, take account of our life going into this day where and this weekend of Easter, where we realize that that the God of the universe stepped into man kind's world to transform and change it forever and then he suffered and died on the cross for our sin the thing that plagues every one of us as he reflected upon mankind he realizes that it's not your bank account he's not these things that we would think traditionally are the things that are plaguing us he knows that the real problem in our lives is this problem of sin and jesus took that on when he was nailed to a cross and then he died in a the greatest act of love that mankind has ever seen. He died on a cross in a very ugly way to take on our sin and give us freedom. So we've been um, for, well, for a couple of weeks now, we've been talking about self-discipline uh, and being disciplined in ourselves. Last uh, time we were together before Sunday Fun Day, we talked about prayer and prayer. How many of you guys realize that prayer should be and is a healthy part of a Christian walk, uh, uh, the way that a Christian lives out their life. Um, I, I talked about the challenges that I've had with prayer and my understanding of prayer and how it has changed over the years that I, I kind of always thought that prayer was, um, like, uh, growing up, I thought that prayer was one of those things that you did at a table or at specific times and before bed and when you wake up in the morning. And, and that was what prayer was meant to be. And then as I got a bit older, and I was craving that relationship with God as he was doing work in my life, I realized that I could just kind of have this ongoing conversation with him uh, on a daily basis when I saw things that piqued my interest. 
uh, I could recognize those before God and go, hey, God, why why did that just happen? Why did I meet this person? Why um, do you want me to do something? Do you want me to engage in this trauma that's happened here? Do you want me to uh, engage in this incident here? And I kind of had this dialogue with God, this just back and forth all day long. Um, it's not really times where I sit down and, and pray for long periods of time, although there are those times. Uh, but I realized that it, it, there's a beautiful relationship that you can have with the Spirit of God as you walk in the Spirit with God. Does that make sense? Um, and that's, that is a, a rhythm of prayer that I think is very healthy for us to introduce uh, and to continue to grow in our lives. I, you know, I, I would say that I talk to God several times per day, and yet it wouldn't hurt me if I talked to God more times per day, if I was just focusing on him a bit more. So uh, in the last few weeks, I have been thinking about that a bit more. It's like, okay, let's, let's ratchet this relationship up, God. Let's take it to a, a new level here. Let's, uh, let's grow a bit. So I hope that you guys are, are also doing that too. And those of you who are, who are watching online and this week, I, I grabbed two, I, I was looking at the, the list of things that I kind of wanted to talk about leading up to Easter. And two of these uh, spiritual disciplines seem to kind of fit together well. So I chose to kind of put those together today. And those two that we're going to talk about today are uh, meditation uh, and some examples of meditation and then self-reflection. Because I think oftentimes when we, when we do meditate, when we get before God and we are uh, reading the scriptures, as we'll talk about in a bit, we're reading the scriptures and then letting the scriptures read us. I think that's the, it's easy to read the scriptures. It's, it's harder to let the scriptures read us and take account of, of what, uh, what God is trying to teach us about himself and ourselves and our relationship to him. So I did want to talk about meditation today, what it is, what it isn't, what it should be and what it should not be because um, there are unhealthy uh, ways to meditate. There are ways that the world has taken something that is beautiful, that God designed, a way of having a connection and a time of focus upon him and his holiness and his goodness. Then the world has taken that and, and in a way bastardized it and made it uh, ugly and made it uh, where people will focus on, uh, well, enriching their own lives and uh, the, and their own selves, glorifying themselves and not being about glorifying God. So we're going to talk about meditation a bit here for a moment. So meditation is just a practice of um, that an individual, people like you and I, a technique that we would, would use uh, to be mindful and just kind of um, push out the how many of you guys get busy and, and your world just starts crashing in on you sometimes? You just have a, a chore list or a laundry list, as it were, a to-do list that just feels so pressing that it's overwhelming, that it's uh, it's not calming to our soul. And and what we should be doing as as believers in in uh, in meditating on the scriptures and meditating on this through the, in this relationship we have with God is, is is having the ability to push those things to the side calm our minds, and then focus on the Spirit of God, uh, what He might be trying to say. Because how many of you guys have ever realized that in the middle of a storm and in the chaos that life brings, the Holy Spirit, if you if you get with the Spirit of God and you, you press into Jesus, that a real peace that passes all understanding can just fall upon your soul. I'm, I was thinking of you, Randy. I, I imagine in all this work that you had, and you realize that, wow, this is way out of the scope that I'm normally handling. Um, I imagine there were times where you were like, God, I, I, I don't know, but I, I need you to handle this stuff. And I'm just going to spend some time fixed on you. I'm going to, I'm going to be prayerful. I'm going to be, I'm going to pray about these things because I don't know how to handle these things. And then just listen to the prompting of the spirit and, and meditation is the practice of doing that fairly regularly doing that on a daily basis it's a basis it's a way of training our attention and our awareness uh on god which brings a calm to our lives because we're not focused on those things that are cluttering our life and and creating the chaos that we're trying to escape oftentimes um, meditation is often used for relaxation and stress reduction and enhancing personal and spiritual 
growth. And I, I think it's been a part of, it hasn't been traditionally something that I've really ever heard talked about. And yet I think it's something that is a spiritual practice that a lot of believers uh, end up doing, just getting alone. And I think it's been kind of wrapped up in this idea traditionally of devotion. It's, uh, you know, uh, growing up and say, hey, have you done your devotions today? Well, devotions for me uh, growing up meant getting away, taking some time, making space for God and nothing else, pushing those things out of my mind and uh, not, al not allowing them to crowd my psyche and uh, the space that God is trying to uh, give peace in and understanding and, and clarity when he... He doesn't always bring clarity. Is it just me? <laughs> At least not when I want it. Usually when I want it, I'm like, could you be a little more clear? I, I don't know exactly what you're doing here. Um, and I think it's interesting, and I think I'll use this verse a little bit later. I think when it says in the Psalms that he is a, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, I think the imagery of that is very interesting because if you've ever carried a lamp or a, a light to your feet it doesn't really go that far out in front of you when you might be looking for more clarity like hey i'd like to look out a hundred yards and see what's around that corner or you know past those bushes over there that look so scary uh god's like no just just trust me in this one here i think of you in some ways carmela with this change of your employment and all that it's like you you know we it's there's something that meditation and our spiritual discipline can bring to the believer that gives you peace even when your life is upended and you're you're in the middle of this chaos and a storm you go you know what uh we were we were at burke's second memorial service yesterday and the girls were reflecting on how their dad oftentimes would just say it's gonna be okay and i, I think through meditation and in spiritual discipline, if we know our Father, if we know our God is good and He's loving and He wants to give good things and He has prepared a way for us and if we just stay close to Him, we can hear His voice just like uh, Debbie and Bert's daughters were saying oftentimes. It's like, it was so comforting to hear their dad say, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. And, and I hope that if we don't hear that oftentimes, that through growing in spiritual discipline and, and meditation, that we can have those very peaceful times where we can push the things away that are bringing chaos in our lives. And just kind of, not tangibly, but hold the hand of God and listen for the still small voice that just says, it's going to be okay. Because when God says it's going to be okay, it's, it's going to be okay. Um, and we're going to make it, even when it doesn't appear even when beyond the light to our feet and the lamp that we have, it looks dark and it looks like there are wolves out there and it looks like danger and chaos. Although God is already planning and making a way, uh, moving those things out uh, of, of, of our way so we don't have to go through all those. And yet, topic for another time, sometimes we go through challenges so that he can grow us and grow our character. So that's for a different time. Yes, sometimes we go through chaos to, I'm going to address this now. Sometimes we go through chaos because God is trying to strengthen us, but in that time, we can still find peace and hear his tender voice saying, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So this practice of, of, of meditation, you know, what does it mean to meditate? Well, it means to, to just focus deeply on, uh, I think that becomes more and more challenging. The the more uh, we have entertainment, they get it, it's getting shorter and shorter. Um, it's, it's kind of ironic in our, in our society now. We have some of the longest entertainment known to man, where what I mean is uh, there can be dramas, you know. We, how many of us have watched a drama that plays out for 10 episodes over 10 seasons and you're just enthralled with it? I can't, you know, there are people talk about getting on Netflix and like watching a whole you know, 100 episodes of some show over the course of a month. And it's like, wow, how do you, how do you focus on that? And yet uh, there are a lot of people who in our society and people are drawn to that, but there are a lot of people who are losing that ability to just push out and focus for any period of time because so much of what we consume is in uh, 
20 second bits uh, through YouTube shorts and TikTok and, um, you know, short videos and people don't sit down and read books as often anymore. Uh, it takes a long time to read a book. Anybody read through a book other than, I know your daughter reads through books really quickly, but it takes me a while to get through a book. Anybody with me? Anybody? Anybody, anybody read anybody ever read the first two chapters of a book and not finish it is that just me <laughs> me too so so this practice of meditation is important um, getting this into the rhythm and i really what i've been talking about uh, and i think is healthy for us is having a rhythm that works for you a rhythm that god is leading you in for your own spiritual discipline uh, whether you know, I, I was always told, hey, you got to get up in the morning, first thing in the morning, before you have a sip of water, before you take a breath of air, before anything, you got to get that Bible out, get on your knees, pray, and then just read for a half an hour, an hour. And and some of us, that probably works for, right? Maybe that works for you. It doesn't necessarily work for me. Uh, I don't do that every day. Uh, but I do find time every day to be in the word and to meditate on the things of God and a prayerful rhythm with God and walking in his spirit. And I have grown as a result of the Holy Spirit working with me to make it. It's kind of like um, when somebody when somebody says, I'll work around your schedule, <laughs> you're like, oh, that's cool. It's nice to know that God isn't tied up at certain times. You don't have to make an appointment with him. And he's like, ah, oh, sorry, next Thursday's not gonna work at noon, but how about Friday at two? No, I'm busy Friday at two. It's nice to know that we, that God uniquely designed us and knew what the rhythm would look like for us to walk with him. And he is available as we walk with him, when we walk with him and how we walk with him. So discovering what that looks like for you, discovering online what that looks like for you, what your rhythm looks like is a healthy aspect of learning how to pray learning how to meditate and learning how to seek, seek that connection with God and find that inner peace. Um, just to let you know, there are, I'm not bringing this meditation thing up and it make this up all on my own. There are examples of meditation in the Bible. Some of you might be thinking of some of them, but I wanted to share a few of them with, and, with you. And one of them is found in Joshua 8, where it says, uh, where it talks about meditating on God's word day and night. And I like the way that that is phrased day and night. Why is that? Because, well, the that's all day, right? All day, like day and night is a full day. Like in Genesis, when it says evening and morning, you know, even, uh, evening and morning were the first day. And it's like, okay, an evening and a morning, a day and a night is a day. So God is telling us in this passage of scripture in Joshua that it talks about meditating on God's word, uh, his word that guides us, that leads us, that shapes us, that molds us. To meditate on those things every day. And in the book of Psalms, chapter one, I love the book of Psalms. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but who delights, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law. Again, here it is again, day and night. He's, God's saying, I want relationship with you all the time. Meditate on these things. So. And it says, and, and those who meditate on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by a stream of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Now, if there's, if there's something that I want my life to be characterized, I want to be characterized by a tree that's by water, that's ever living and everlasting and, and I'm growing and uh, and I don't wither and die. And, and, and that's where our strength comes from. So this passage of scripture, the, the writer David is writing here in the Psalms. He's, he's just very eloquently stating that, he's saying this, let me make it simple. If you stay close to God, if you talk with him day and night, you're gonna be okay. It's gonna be all right. Things are gonna be good for you. And then Psalm 119, 15 talks about meditating on God's precepts or his commandments or his direction. Uh, day and night, we meditate on these things. So um, I, I did want to just touch on this because I did say up front, there are some weird uh, practices of meditation that you can get into. And I've talked about this in the past uh, in things in our culture. 
through a spiritual lens, through listening to the Word of God, reading the Word of God, we should begin to have an understanding of what is good that is from our culture, from the world. That's like, okay, I can receive that. That's a godly thing. Showing people kindness and love. Yeah, there are people in our culture who show kindness and love. And that's something we can just be a part of and we can receive that aspect of it. But there are things in our culture, you guys could name them. We could probably name them for the next half an hour at least, uh, that we should reject in culture. It's just not uh, healthy for people not healthy for us it's not something we want to be giving our energy our time talent and treasure to it's not something that we want to contribute to or we want to push forward or we, we really don't want it to be able to take root in our culture so there should be pushback from Christians against such things there are things in our culture that we just plainly have to reject because they are evil they are wrong and there is nothing good in those things and then there are other things that um, that we can redeem. How many of you guys know that <laughs> there have been times in, in Christian past where people are like, oh, uh, dancing and music and those things are bad. There are certain denominations of Christians who believe that music and instruments are a bad thing. I don't know how they do that in reading the scripture when, when God had the people of Israel marching around playing instruments. Like, you know, he kind of commanded that and then he used that to make walls fall down. So I, I don't know that there's something wrong, but there are, there are types of music. There are other things in our culture that we have to, that we as Christians should be working to redeem. Right, so we've talked about this before. And uh, the Bible does warn against empty or deceptive forms of meditation. Uh, meditation that is not centered on God or on his grace or his mercy or his spirit, but it's centered on other things. It doesn't align with God's truth. There is meditation that advises um, people to essentially elevate themselves to the point of God and work on themselves. That, um, that the goodness we can create comes from our inner being. And the Bible tells us that the reality is that there's nothing good in us except the God that is in us. There's, we don't inherently uh, create good, we reflect the glory of God. But the glory does not come from our inner being. We are fallen people prone to sin who will seek evil uh, oftentimes that what we do is we can embody the spirit of God and then reflect God from us. So there is this idea and it's popular in our modern culture to meditate and, and, you know, there's, there's practice through yoga of trying to find your chakra. I don't know what all this stuff means. And you, you use stones and all this stuff. And it's like, Whoa, seems, uh, seems a little, little bit out there. So there are forms of meditation that are not healthy and that believers should not be engaging in and reading the bible having a relationship with god um, and allowing his spirit to check you allowing the bible to read you which we'll get into in just a moment is very important so we know what those things are the things that we can accept the things that we can receive the things that we should reject wholly and the things that need to be redeemed so meditation is not bad but the focus of the meditation, when we, when we, when the focus is glorifying ourselves or making ourselves better, uh, that is not something we should be focusing on. We should be becoming better people, but it should be as a result of the work that God is doing in us and the character that He's building in us and through us. Are you with me? So, what we shouldn't be doing. Let me make that clear and plain. Don't meditate on things that minimize God and glorify people or things. Uh, that is what we call idolatry. When you glorify yourself, when you glorify other created things, the Bible talks about uh, that our tendency as human beings is to worship the created and not the creator. So when we're thinking about meditation, our eyes and our focus should be on worshiping the creator and not created things, which we are part of. We are created things. Hope we're clear with that. So, some of the don'ts, the Bible says in Colossians 2, verses 6 through 8, it says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow 
of deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Everything good that comes out of us comes through God and through the Spirit of God. What we should be doing, Psalm 16, 8 says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. When the Lord God is at our right hand, which means we're right next to him, doing battle with the enemy, uh, that we will not be shaken. So, uh, I hope that's clear. <laughs> I hope that uh, as you understand, if you have questions, you go, hey, you know, there's this thing. and Because there's been a lot of... Um, there's, there's a sneaky way that the devil likes to twist what God has. He likes to take the, the holy and the sacred and pervert it. So what God meant for good, meditation and, and having this ability to connect with God through prayer, the enemy of our soul wants to twist it and pervert it and take what is sacred and tweak it just enough to where it sounds like like a lot of this new age stuff that's going on in our world, it sounds like, oh, this is, yeah, this is good. And it's easy for people's ears to be sucked in and to fall into that. But the reality is it's a path that leads to destruction and evil because the enemy of our soul is twisting those things. So what's an important and a, and a helpful aspect of this is to be able to self-reflect. What am I reflecting out into the world? What am I putting out into the world? Is it Jesus or is it me? Am I elevating me through meditation? Am I elevating myself? Am I glorifying myself? And, and, and this is a challenge. I, I'll say this as a, as a pastor, whether, you know, whatever it is, it's, um, I've seen so many pastors fall because they, they get intoxicated with uh, their image in many ways and what people say about them and how they are glorified and they start to believe those things. And I think it's an, an absence of self-reflection that realizing that all of us as Christians are just tools in the hand of God meant for displaying his glory, not our glory. And when we start to take that glory that's meant for God and put it on our shoulders, we break because we are not meant to carry the glory that was only intended for God to carry upon his shoulders. And I think oftentimes if we don't self-reflect, and it's easy to do as a pastor, I think it's easy to do um, in a friend group when you find yourself better than the people around you. Maybe, maybe you're one of the leaders of the group and you're like, hey, man, I... I sure feel like an eagle around all these turkeys that I'm helping out here and and which is a, a again a perversion it's like no no let's look at this in a right way God is using you because he has done all the work on all the good you see in you are the things that God has done in your life and brought you to that point not so that you can glorify yourself or be glorified but so that you can help other people who are also following in your footsteps who are being discipled by you who are learning to be more like Christ as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So self-reflection is really important. I want to read a passage of scripture from uh, the book of Matthew chapter 7. It says this, it says, do not judge or you too will be judged for in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured against you. Why do you look at a speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrites. How many like being called a hypocrite? How many of you guys ever been judging somebody? You're like, oh yeah, I kind of guess I do that too. <laughs> but you didn't vocalize it, so you're like, okay, let's just push that to the side, God. Let's deal with this. We'll handle this when we get some time here. And yeah, I realized that that, ugh, that evil just kind of crept up a little bit in me. That was, that was not you. That was definitely me. Self-reflection is important. Let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I think it's... Um, we could spend a lifetime working on ourselves and take, taking the plank out of our eye. Even, uh, I know several of you guys have followed 
Christ for many years, and, and yet it's so easy and tempting to get to, to just hear gossip and let it resonate with you a little bit, like, oh, I'm glad I'm not that person. I'm glad I'm not like them. And, and we, we find ourselves oftentimes measuring, I've talked about comparison. I think one of the greatest failures we do in comparing ourselves is comparing ourselves to other people who are maybe not as good as us in some ways, instead of comparing us to the holiness of God and the image of Jesus Christ, who we should be uh, looking up to as, as an idol to worship, a, a God to be to idolize. If I want to be like anybody in this world, I want to be like Jesus, right? Like it, I, I fail that every single day, and there is this rhythm in my life of self-reflection like that. Jeremy, that wasn't good. And if you don't, if you're never saying, if you're not saying that self to yourself every day, you should be. I, I would like for you each to work into your maybe the, uh, a recap before you lay. How, how many of you guys just raise your hand if you if you kind of go through your day when you lay on your pillow before you fall asleep? I know my wife doesn't because she falls asleep in a fraction of a second. There's no way she could possibly go through the events of the day. But how many of you guys re have some time for reflection, like on a daily basis, and go? Pfft. Man, I'm kind of slipping in that area. I've I've been I've been better there before. I I've let some I've let some of the enemy creep into my life there. Um, I think that should be something that we are working in to our lives every day. But it's it's hard to do that, right? It's yeah, when we when we want to glorify ourselves, it's easy in this. It, look, anybody in this world could find somebody worse than them, right? Like if you. It, I just haven't murdered anybody. Oh, great! What a bar you're! What a bar you're achieving at this point, right? You just hurdled that bar so well. I haven't killed anybody in my whole life. Okay, I'm okay. Good. Like, but that's that's it's not great. You shouldn't ever kill anybody. That should be very rare. That, and you should have done it on an accident if it happened to you. And you should be very remorseful for that. There's always somebody that we can look to and compare ourselves to to make ourselves look better. And I've seen this in my own kid's life. Whenever I call one of them out on something, uh, you if you know kids or been around kids, well, they're like, but but what? But what about them? <laughs> but it's, it's this story, it's this passage of scripture right here played out for me so regularly. And I, it's kind of good for me to have kids because when I do correct them, because that's my job to correct them. And immediately I see them blame it on their sister, their brother, or a friend. It, it reminds me of this passage of scripture. Jeremy, you're not doing it right now, but you do this. You do this in your own mind. Oh, at least I'm not like them. And, and <coughs> pardon me. I think what it robs us from when we focus on what other people are and how we're better than them, it robs us of the growth that the Spirit of God is trying to do in our lives because we don't self-reflect enough to say, yeah, this is an area, whether it's gossip or greed or... How many of you know we guys, we're greedy? We're greedy people, right? Like, how many of you guys have enough stuff right now that you never really would need much of anything else in your life? If you just... If it didn't have to be new or clean or stylish or trendy or, I mean, I know things wear out and you'll have to get some things, but how many of us are guilty of just buying things because, just because we wanted them? Just because I want it. I, I just like it. It's cool. And yet, do, do we regularly push and go, do I need that or is that is that greed in my life? What? What could I do with this money that I'm spending on this? I mean, let me ask this question. If you just took your Amazon account, <laughs> I don't buy much on Amazon anymore, but it's, it's, good, it's good for people. A lot of people buy off Amazon. So if you just took your Amazon account for the last five years, how many of those things can you not account for now? How many of those things could you go, yeah, if I had the chance, I never would have bought that. I mean, how many hundreds or thousands of dollars uh, could you, yeah, that's just something we do as Americans. There are a lot of things that we have. Just take account of your garage or storage space or whatever that is. Things that you'd have it touched in six months or a year. Thought that it was going to be so necessary for your life. Self-reflection is so 
good for that because what it does is it helps us focus on the things, the areas in our life where we need to grow, where the Spirit of God is 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 talking to us, is leading us into areas where we need to grow. One of the things I, I like to talk about oftentimes is uh, this idea of how many of you have ever known anybody, maybe it's been you, where maybe it is you, and this is some place that God wants to work in your life. You know what your reputation is with people, but in here and in here, you know that your character doesn't quite match up to what the reputation is that you have. Some people have greater character than their reputation, right? And that's not a bad place to be, but the opposite is true oftentimes. Sometimes people have uh, a much greater reputation than their character. And that difference between character and reputation is uh, the ability for us to self-reflect and look at what do people think of me? And I've said this sometimes, I wish I were as good as people think that I am. How many of you ever said that? I wish I was as good as people think that I am. Uh, because I'd be a really great guy when people say these things. If you've ever been to a funeral, if you've ever been to a funeral and you said, and, and you, I was talking about with my neighbor this morning about this. You ever been to a funeral and you go, is, am I at the right place? What are they saying about this guy? Like, I don't, I don't know that this person, this person's reputation was far better than their character because I knew different. And in this ability, in this time of self-reflection, uh, understanding what your reputation and your character is, is that that differential is, a, is the ability for us to grow and go, I, I want to be as good. I want God to help me be as good as people think I am, as the, the thoughts that bang around in here. Uh, there are ugly things that bounce around in our head. I know it happens all the time, especially when you're on the road. Somebody's going slow in front of you or not turning at that light. They didn't leave you enough room to make that right-hand turn. I know the things that go on in my head. It's like, I don't want to be that person. I want to grow in my character to reach that reputation. So the last thing I want to talk about today is the, this, this ability, um, reading the Bible and the scriptures is important in many ways. One, it's to understand there is a right way and a wrong way to live and finding that through um, following Jesus Christ, reading his word, having this relationship with God and, and allowing him to speak to you. And, and yet I've, I've realized over the years that we read the scriptures, you grow up and people, or if you're living in a Christian home, it's like, I'll read the Bible. I read the Bible and you're like, ah, oh, it's just a bunch of stories. And but when you start reading these stories and you realize what God is doing from beginning to end, the, the love story that he's showing, but also um, as you read these stories of people, you can you start to associate with these people. And as you read the Bible, you start to realize that if you, if you meditate on it, like we've talked about, and you do some self-reflection in that time, you start to realize that not only are you reading the Bible, but the Bible is reading you. The Bible is is reading you. It's telling you, hey, hey, you're a lot like this character you're reading about. And and you see how their life went. And you have some of those character traits, don't you? It, it's, it's a way to read history and find wisdom and realize that, that the God of the universe has given us this great tool in the scriptures to read. Like when people do and live their lives these ways, it goes badly for them. But when you put God first, and when you put other people first, and when you're caring and you're loving, and you realize that there is a way that is healthy to live, that God is lighting our path and leading us forward and letting the scriptures read us and shape us to become better people. Because I've said this, you become like the top five people that you hang out with, right? So I always try to hang out with people that are smarter than me and, and speak better and, and ones that, that well, the friends that I hang out with, they like tearing me down. So they like to not compliment me. So that's probably good. It doesn't feed my ego. But I say you become like the top five people that you hang out with. So we should be wanting to be around people who are uh, better than us in many ways. There are people in my life right now that I see uh, who do things better than me. I'm like, man, I wish I were more like them in this area of my life. I want to spend more time with them so I become more like them. And the reality is that the Bible is one of those. It's a way of being 
in relationship, getting Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, into your top five. Because if there's anybody that I want to be like, I want to be characterized by people that I'm like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be loving when I'm not loving. I want to hold my tongue when I don't want to hold my tongue. I want to be that person. Because then you can live a life where you don't have these regrets. So having this ability to meditate on the scriptures, let the scriptures read you, and have the ability to self-reflect and be, and this is a big, bad H word, be honest with yourself. Who am I? Am I the person that I want to be? When I'm laying in that coffin someday, do I want people, when they're saying good things about me, do I want that to be uh, the reputation I had or do I want, I want that to be my character that they're talking about? And the reality is for me, I, I hope people, and I, and I had this, I had a really great blessing um, on my 40th birthday. We had, we were meeting in the church. I felt really great about it because I found out that there was a surprise party for me. I just sniffed it out and I, I had the Sherlock Holmes skills and, you know, I played it off like I didn't know, but I knew and it was cool. But there was something really cool. My friend Justin uh, came, he was invited and he came and uh, he watched the videos that people had sent in about what, how, what I meant to them and how I live my life. And, and I realized that, yes, those were truthful things that people were saying, that my, my character and my reputation were at least close, maybe not in everybody's eyes at parody, but they were at least close. And I got to have a conversation with my friend Justin, and uh, he's, a men he's a mentee of mine, and he's maybe five years younger than me. And he said, you know, if I were turning 40, it, there wouldn't have been that many people of character showing up, saying good things about me. He said, I've lived my life in a way, uh, I probably should have thrown him under the bus, but he said this, he's, I think he's, he said, I lived my life up until this point, and this was six years ago. Uh, he said, I lived my life in such a way that people would just come up and be like, oh yeah, Justin was fun at the parties and he was this guy. And, He's like, but it wasn't like deep, meaningful things. It's not the things that you want people to say about you when you're laying in a coffin someday. When they say, man, he was, he was, all, he was always that friend that would go above and beyond. I could always rely on him. He was always uh, pouring into my life. He was always uh, saying kind things about it, helping other people. He was generous with his life, with his time, with his talent, with his treasure. He said, and I, I want to be that person. And, I, and I, it's been really great being able to see Justin, uh, you know, knowing him for 20, almost 20 years now. And to see the man of God that he's become uh, just by being a part of his life. I'm not saying it's me, but he saw something in me that he wanted to follow. And now he's, he's married to a woman, a Christian woman, and he's raising his boys. And he's struggling with those things that those old temptations in his life. And, and he's put many of those things to bed. And I've seen God really work in his life. And it's just been a beautiful journey to see that. So what I'm getting at is that there's in this season of Lent, when we take time to look at our lives and reflect on what they are and who we want to be, the character uh, that we want people talking about, not just our reputation on that day when we're laying in a coffin, people are saying things about us. I want those things to be true. I want people to say great things about the way that I live my life. And I want those things to be accurate and true. And I want those things for you because when you live a life that way, it feels good to live a life that way, to be a blessing to people, to be the one who's always going above and beyond. It, it brings joy and peace in your life uh, that, that only God can give through uh, living this way. So uh, as, we, as we continue through the season of Lent, moving to Easter, to this time where we get to reflect on the greatest gift that God has ever given us, which is the separation of him taking on our sin and saying that we can live free in this life and not have to live with the guilt and shame because God died on the cross for our sins and we get to be with him in heaven again someday. Uh, and this life is just temporary, but we have all of eternity. Uh, but what we do here matters. Uh, there's a, my favorite line in the movie Gladiator is um, the line where uh, Maximus is there and he says, what we do in this life echoes in eternity. And I, I just, and that one always resonates with me. What we do in this life for Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
echoes in eternity, the impact that it makes on people's lives, how the things that we actually do, the way that we live our life actually shapes reality around us. It's a beautiful thing. So as we continue through the season, I want you guys to maybe use that imagery thinking of what are people going to say about you when you pass? How did you live your life? Who did you help? Were you kind? Were you loving? Did you edify people or were you tearing people down? Um, what does that look like? And then take account. Do the work. Ask the Spirit of God to help you and grow in those areas. And, and then practice at it. That's what it is. Just practice. Uh, Janie would tell you I've failed many, many times in raising my kids. I would tell you I've failed many, many times where I've either lost my temper or just not been as kind or loving or compassionate in areas but it's something that I reflect on and I grow in because it's important I don't want them to be emotionally damaged and traumatized uh, when they leave my home I want them to come back and want to be around mom and dad when they don't have to be around us anymore uh, and I want people to be that way too so if you guys would let's bow our heads and pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be out here to um, grapple with your word, what your, what the scriptures say about how we are to live our lives and the benefit, the joy and peace that we get from that and, and how you use our lives to be a blessing to others and, and reflect your glory and your goodness uh, in this earth. The ability that you have through our kind words and our deeds to change hearts and change minds about ultimately who you are, that they might have uh, they might have a relationship with their loving Father, just like we do. We pray that in the coming weeks we, have, uh, we see many opportunities for us to grow and to self-reflect and create these rhythms in our life of, of prayerfulness and meditation and um, fixing our thoughts and our minds on you and praying for people. Um, asking you to do work in their lives, asking you to show them and reveal yourself to them. We pray for Melissa as she's been uh, in the hospital over the evening, and we pray that she heals and this migraine goes away for her. We ask these things in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.